What's up my YouTube friends and watchers of my channel, which is currently called Israel on Foot. The problem is, is I'll no longer be in Israel as I'm moving back to the United States within the next couple of weeks. I'm presently here in the United States and it's going to be permanent. So in the coming days and maybe on the chat board that, that is part of this video, you can suggest to me a new name for this channel as I'm no longer Israel on Foot, but Israel in America? Israel on my rear end, uh, Steve, the YouTube channel, I don't know, help me to come up with a new name. And I hope I can come up with a new name. Uh, I'm not sure what the latitude is on YouTube for changing the name of a YouTube channel as it's usually connected to a Google email account. Uh, and that email account has to be in the same name as the channel. And I certainly don't want to lose the archive of all the videos that I've made heretofore. So we'll see what I can do, but uh, very soon, and you could actually say from this moment and probably already from a few months ago, the name Israel on foot was no longer uh, accurate. Anyway, this is volume two of my new series called The Competing Jewish and Christian Interpretations of the Bible. And it's for people like us who love the Bible. I mentioned in the last uh, volume, okay, the, the, the inaugural episode, why I was doing this, that I was uh, inspired by courses I took at Hebrew University as a master's degree student several years ago. I remember uh, being taught in classes that were co-taught by panels of Jews, Catholic priests, uh, atheists, all sorts of people, but particularly that crossroads between uh, Jewish people, uh, not all of whom are Jewish believers in the Bible, some of whom are secular, others Orthodox, okay, as well as Catholic priests. Now, these particular Catholic priests were from a Catholic university in Jerusalem called Ecole Biblique, a very significant place, being that they were among the very first people to work with a corpus known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, in other words, the priests that teach there are also scholars, they're not just priests, and some of them uh, have comprised the world-renowned class of scholars that have dealt with that corpus called the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this was amazing stuff. And I remember sitting through these classes and saying, man, I wish my predominantly Christian tourist uh, who I guide in Israel could participate in these classes. So uh, that wasn't possible. But what I'm trying to achieve in this particular series is to bring some of the wealth that I picked up from those classes and from living in Israel uh, here to the YouTube space or cyberspace, okay? So of course, the people that will watch us are people that love the Bible. And I'm hoping that it will attract people from both worlds, from both religions, Judaism and Christianity. It's true that the people that I've guided over uh, the years, almost 20 years, I was a licensed tour guide in Israel, overwhelmingly evangelical Christian. Okay. Uh, in fact, the only Jewish group I ever guided was my own mother's group, a group of people from Philadelphia who were childhood friends, a, a mixed group of Jews and Catholics. The reason why over the years I guided exclusively uh, for the most part evangelical Christians is because my own forte, my own expertise is the ancient Roman world. Okay. The ancient world in which the New Testament took place. Christian tours tend to be more interested in that era of history than secular Jewish tours. Uh, when secular Jews come to Israel, including college kids that come for free, okay, uh, on a movement known as birthright, they get a whole smorgasbord of themes other than the Bible and ancient history. They get a lot more modern day Israel, uh, a lot more of the wars of modern day Israel. Uh, they visit the kibbutz movement. These are all things that I love to do and wish I could do uh, with my Christian groups. The problem is, is that my Christian tours are always limited, sometimes only eight or nine days in the country during which they prioritize biblical sites. They just certainly, they don't make the time for these other things, which they too would find fascinating, okay? Uh, I do have a pastor who uh, every other year when he comes, takes the tour to Israel's Museum of Tanks, okay, an armament called uh, the Latrun Museum, and it's amazing, but he's the only Christian group I have that does that. I wish all of them would do it. Uh, to his credit, he does it. Um, so the days of Steve the tour guide are coming to an end.
Uh, in fact, the very last day I ever worked as a tour guide was on my birthday, March 12th, 2020, when the coronavirus uh, broke out. I had a group in the country who we had to uh, quarantine at the King David Hotel. It happened to be the only group I ever had at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, uh, probably Israel's most famous hotel. And it turns out that they were probably the last group uh, that I've ever guided. I, I am scheduled for more tours. Uh, and if those tours come, I will commute back to Israel to finish out those tours that I'm committed to. I'm actually committed to tours, believe it or not, all the way to 2023. But I'm not going to take any more tours. I'm not going to uh, register for any more tours because I'm no longer going to be living in Israel. It means each time I commute there, the guided tour, I got to pay for a plane ticket, find lodging to stay. I no longer will have an apartment of my own to stay in. Uh, in Jerusalem. So I'm finishing my years as Steve, the tour guide, and hopefully transitioning to something else. I hope there's something else out there. I always thought maybe I would use my education in academia back here in the United States. Uh, I'm hoping that pans out, that that works out. Okay, so it's the end of the days of Steve, the tour guide. For those of you that know me as such, and uh, one day, hopefully, I'll uh, re- Revamp is something else. Is Steve the teacher or Steve the something else? For now, I'm here at my parents' home. For those of you that follow this channel, you know that I've been here for the last several months, actually since March, uh, when my father has suffered a setback in his health. Okay, and since then, I've had to switch gears from Steve, who was making videos in Israel, guiding people through tours of Israel, to Steve, who's transitioning to this type of thing, uh, Bible studies, history lessons, and whatnot. So, again, this is the second episode in the series, The Competing Interpretations of Judaism and Christianity. And it's not intended to conquer one religion over the other. Uh, as I said in the last episode, the first episode, rarely do such knockouts happen, okay? Uh, usually both Judaism and Christianity both have very long developed interpretations of the verses that are in dispute between the two religions, and rarely does one score a knockout over the other. And the same thing is going to happen in this week's lesson, but I find that all the more interesting. Now, if you recall, I said in the first episode uh, a, a few weeks ago that there's the Christian interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, there's the Jewish interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, and there's usually my favorite, the one that I'm most intellectually interested in, which was the original interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. What did a particular verse mean to the original audience to whom it was intended? We covered this in Isaiah 7:14. Okay, uh, when we went over the various meanings and uh, metamorphoses of that verse, how it's it, how it evolved over several centuries to mean different things to different people. Okay, and it's going to be the same thing with this verse. Verse, uh, the verse in Genesis one, ver, uh, chapter one, verse twenty six. Let us make man in our image. Who is the us in that verse? Let us make man in our image. Now, obviously, since Christian times, the us is believed by Christians to be the Trinity, okay? That the Trinity was both present at and cooperating, okay? Uh, the Trinity believes in the three persons of the one monotheistic God of Judaism, okay? Other Jews don't believe that the Trinity can be reconciled with monotheism. And for that reason, Jews historically don't consider Christianity to even be a monotheistic religion. I'm not talking about secular Jews here in America, but I'm saying those Jews that you would see in Jerusalem walking around in black hats and suits. If you ask one of them, what do you really think about Christianity? They'll tell you uh, it's polytheistic, all because of this issue, the Trinity, okay? But I also uh, maintain that before Christian times, these verses had to mean something to people that had read them and to whom uh, they were endeared for centuries, okay? Now, Christians, of course, and I've dealt with this for 20 years of being a tour guide, often come from the point of view that it's just so obvious that Jesus is in all of the Old Testament. He's on every page and every chapter and every story, okay? But a lot of that, if you remember, comes from a starting point that most Christians begin with, okay, when they open the Bible, and that is that Jesus was predestined, okay, to be born as the Savior of the world, 
Okay, he died on the cross. Again, all this was predestined, okay, before the foundations of the earth. And therefore, all of scripture looked forward to his coming. Okay, and I said in that first episode, and therefore many Christians actually begin reading the Bible with the New Testament, and only after they become established in their faith and knowledge of the New Testament do they start to read backwards or backtrack into what they call the Old Testament to find all these verses that I'll refer to as Christological verses, okay, in other words, verses that Matthew, such as Isaiah 7, 14, okay, uh, that are mentioned by the Gospels is referring to Jesus in the Old Testament, okay? And none of what I'm going to teach in this episode or in the last episode or in future episodes is meant to negate any of that. Uh, like I said, you could argue that all three of these uh, meanings to to the verses that we're going to deal with in the series can coexist with one another. It doesn't have to come. It's not a zero sum game where one religion has to triumphantly run away with the victory crown. And rarely will such a victory come. Okay, and it won't come either in this. Okay, uh, you'll see that both the pre-Christian, the Jewish, and the Christian take on all this are all reasonable. Okay. And therefore, if you're a Christian and you believe that, well, Steve, all these verses, including Isaiah 7, 14, are, are talking about Jesus. It didn't come because of your intellect. You didn't come to believe that because of you being some sort of intellectually superior person to the Jewish people. In fact, the New Testament itself teaches that if you believe in all these verses pointing to Jesus, it's because Jesus himself and the Spirit of God led you to that. Okay, you can't take any credit for that. Um, I'm going to read to you, actually. I just think it's interesting. I thought about that before I set out to do this. I was like, I, I do want to hit that point so that nobody ever gets cocky and thinks that they understand the Bible or have or their particular interpretation of the Bible comes to them by way of superior intellect over everybody else, okay? Um, so let's just establish that right now as a New Testament truth for those of you that are Christians. If you turn with me, and by the way, to every one of these teachings, you wanna bring a Bible, this is essentially a Bible teaching, a Bible-centered series, okay? So if you wanna put the pause button on the video and get a Bible, be my guest, I won't be offended. I'm turning now to John chapter six, verse 44, okay? Uh, and now I just gotta find it here. I thought I marked it off in my Bible. Okay, here it is, this is famous, okay? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, okay? Now, the verse, uh, the word in Greek, el kuo, for uh, what this, Bible in English refers to drawing, actually means to drag or to compel somebody. It's a much stronger word than to draw. When you and I read in English uh, to draw somebody to scripture or to draw somebody to something else, we think of uh, a good metaphor would be drawing a bee to honey, okay? But the bee isn't compelled or dragged to that honey. Something inside that bee draws them to the honey. Okay, or draws them to the fragrance of the flower. Okay, but the word used here in John chapter six is the exact same word that we find in the book of James. Okay, which I'm going to turn to now. James chapter two. Okay, uh, what verse is it here? Verse seven. Okay, where James says, "Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called?" Okay. Before that, it says, "Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court?" The word that the English translator here in the uh, English Standard Version Bible chose to uh, render is to drag is the exact same Greek word that that same English translator in the Book of John chose for the less forceful word draw, okay? But it is the same word, el kuo. So uh, here in the book of John, okay, if we if we let the word mean the same thing throughout every use of it in the New Testament, it's only used twice from what I know, okay? It means to compel or drag somebody uh, to something, not just to draw somebody to something. So if you believe in the New Testament, if you've come to believe in Jesus, the New Testament says you did not do that by way of your own intellect, or that you're intellectually superior to people in uh, 
Judaism or uh, atheist scholars, okay? But rather the spirit of God drew you to that. It actually compelled you or dragged you to that revelation. That's what it's saying in the Greek. Hopefully you're still with me. And with that, we're now gonna jump into uh, the, the main teaching here for the episode, okay? Let's turn to Genesis 1, verse 26. Okay, and here is the verse in dispute. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, now, since Christian times, Christians have believed without any sort of doubt that this is referring to the Trinity. So much so that in the fourth century AD, a church council ruled to excommunicate anybody that denies that. Okay, anybody... Uh, who claims to be a Christian since the fourth century denies that uh, it's referring to the Trinity, according to that council, they are to be excommunicated. Okay. But obviously it had to mean something before Christian times. And what we learn as we study the Bible, and it's really fascinating, is that there's two Jewish lineages, BC, okay, both of which are before Christ, that uh, shed light on that verse, okay? The first one being that uh, it refers not so much to the Trinity, but to a council of angels or to a council of lesser divinities or to a council of a divine entourage, okay, that follows Yahweh. And in a minute, I'm going to show you other verses from the Bible that do speak of such a divine council of angels that uh, God often takes counsel with okay, before he does something. Uh, and the second version of a Jewish before Christ understanding of let us make man in our image is that it's referring to a secondary agent through whom God created the world. Now, in the beginning, or it was, uh, let's say in earliest times, it was believed to be wisdom, okay? And wisdom, by the way, is a feminized word in Hebrew. So, uh, lady wisdom, it's often called, okay? Later on, that came to be understood as synonymous with the Torah, and therefore Jews believed that the Torah pre-existed the Torah. In other words, just like Christians believe that Jesus pre-existed his incarnation in the first century, okay? So does Orthodox Judaism and even Judaism BC before Christ show signs of believing that the Torah pre-existed the Torah being given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So these are the two uh, versions of the Jewish belief on what was going on in the creation story with the verse, let us create man in our image. Now, I'm first going to relate to the first of those two uh, scenarios or these two uh, possibilities, and that is that the us in Genesis 1.26 is referring to a divine council of angels, okay? or a, uh, an entourage that follows Yahweh. And there's actually a couple verses nearby in Genesis that seem to allude to that, okay? So I'm turning to uh, Genesis chapter 3, okay? And this is when God expels Adam, uh, Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, okay? They've sinned. They're no longer worthy to live in paradise. You remember the story, God does not want them to be able to extend their hand to grab uh, the fruit from uh, the tree that would give them eternal life, okay? And the verse says, then Yahweh said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way from the tree of life. Okay, so here, Genesis chapter three, verse 22, God says, behold, the man has become like one of us. Who's the us in that verse of Genesis? Well, most people who read that don't feel as strongly led to say that that's the Trinity. 
okay? And therefore, it's already inferring to perhaps a divine entourage of lesser beings, okay? Uh, angelic beings, most likely, okay? Uh, an angelic entourage that God speaks to before he does these things, okay? And again, in the book of Genesis, uh, nearby, not so far, you remember the story of the Tower of Babel, okay? Uh, where God's about to confuse the languages uh, or confuse the language. Up until that point, uh, humankind only spoke one language and now God wants to confuse that language. And he says, come, let us go down and confuse uh, and confuse their tongues, okay? Or confuse their language uh, so that they're not able to succeed in cooperating with one another to build that tower into the high heavens, okay? Who's the us in that? Other verse in Genesis, again, not as strong as an impression as Genesis 1, uh, 26 that it's referring to the Trinity, but rather to a council of lesser beings, a council of angels, okay? Uh, but again, I can't, I can't prove anything with those two verses, okay? They're really just strong inferences. But the verses I'm now gonna share with you throughout the other books of the Old Testament are much more to the point, okay, that uh, they envision God in heaven being surrounded by a council of angels with whom he uh, confers. Okay, so I'm now turning to the book of First Kings. Okay, it's chapter 22, verse 19. This is the story of Ahab. If you remember, Ahab was an exceedingly wicked king of Israel. He had a, a very wicked wife named Jezebel. And God wants to basically kill him at this point, okay? And he confers with a council of angels around his throne in heaven, and it reads as following, okay? A, a prophet uh, testifies to seeing this uh, in a vision, okay? We'll call him uh, Micah, okay? Not Micah, the, after whom a book is is named, okay, another, another Micah here. He said, therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at remote Gilead? And one said one thing and one said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before Yahweh saying, I will entice him. And Yahweh said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and be the lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, certainly you will entice him and you will succeed to go out and do so. Okay. So here in the book of first Kings chapter 22, a prophet testifies to having had a vision where Yahweh is sitting on his throne, referring or conferring with an entourage of angels. Okay. And Jews or Judaism before Christ would believe that that is the entourage of angels being referred to in Genesis 1, 26, the us and come, let us make man in our image, okay? Um, that same entourage of angels is, is alluded to or referred to in uh, the book of Job, okay? In uh, Job chapter one, verse six, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh and Satan also came among them, okay? So again, here they're called the uh, sons of God, okay? But again, it's alluding or referring to a council or uh, a council of lesser beings, okay? Of, uh, of what you and I would call today angels. Okay, and lastly, I'll refer to Psalm chapter 82, okay? Uh, the very first verse of that Psalm says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So it's referring to both angels and minor deities there. It's actually saying gods, okay? Um, so before Christ, before the Christian era, the Bible refers to, and it appears that the Jewish people believe that Yahweh is surrounded in heaven by a council of divine angels or an entourage of lesser divine beings, okay? And he consults with them before he does things, much as a earthly king would consult with his elders or with his wise men, okay, uh, uh, before... Uh, adopting a particular uh, path of action. Okay, that is the first 
version of what Jews likely believed concerning uh, that verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. Now, the second scenario is even more interesting. I mean, it's fascinating. And if you follow me for just a few minutes, you'll see how it dovetails perfectly uh, with the first century, okay, in ways that even surprised me when I was first exposed uh, to these verses myself when I encountered them in uh, college, okay, and that is the belief that God was assisted in his creation by a partner, okay, or by an agent of creation. Uh, sometimes that agent is referred to as wisdom. Sometimes that agent is referred to as the logos in Greek, which means literally the word. And that should already cause those of you who are Christians to think, wait a minute, that, that, that reminds you of uh, what's called the prologue in the book of John. Okay, uh, the first several verses of the first chapter of the gospel according to John refers to the logos being uh, the word who was uh, an agent of the creation of God. Okay, from the very beginning. Uh, and sometimes it's referred to as what you would refer to in English, Shekinah, uh, in Hebrew, Shekinah, which means the glory of God. Okay. It too has a lineage that goes back before Christ. It actually begins in the book of Proverbs, to which I'm returning right now. Okay. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Yahweh by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens, and by his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down uh, the dew. Okay, so I'll just repeat 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. That's the beginning of a belief in the Bible, okay, that there is a secondary agent involved that helped God uh, in the creation. OK, now, if you advance in the book of uh, Proverbs, if you go to chapter eight, OK, uh, wisdom is speaking again of herself. Now, just know that uh, wisdom is a feminine word in Hebrew. Uh, so here, that's what I mean when I say she's speaking of herself, OK, as an independent agent created by God, but coexisting as, uh, uh, to the side of God. OK, here in uh, chapter eight. Uh, at verse 22, it says, Yahweh, this is wisdom speaking of herself, Yahweh created me in the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of gold, of old, okay? So uh, here, wisdom is speaking of, of herself as being created by God and uh, being the first creation of God, okay? And uh, through whom, of course, God worked uh, in his creation. OK, and uh, lastly, I'll stay here in Proverbs chapter eight. It says, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him, always rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. OK, so there we have in the Proverbs beginning of this belief that there's a secondary agent, uh, definitely not a second person of God. OK, and at no time in Judaism did it believe that Yahweh is uh, divided into separate persons. OK, uh, like the Trinity of Christianity, but definitely the belief here clearly mentioned in the book of Proverbs is that way back at the beginning, when God set out to create the world, he had a secondary agent who worked as a master workman. That's what wisdom says of herself here, okay? And that that was lady wisdom, okay? In Hebrew, again, a feminized verb. Um, now, this belief, okay, in a secondary agent evolves even more in the intertestamental period. It gets very fascinating, okay? Uh, between the Old and New Testaments, there are a, bod a body of work called the Apocrypha, and one of the books of the Apocrypha is called The Wisdom of uh, Ben Sirah, 
okay? Ben Sira was the son of a Jerusalem priest that wrote a book of wisdom called The Wisdom of Ben Sira. Uh, originally wrote it in Hebrew. His grandson would then go write it in Greek when he himself had to flee Jerusalem and take up a new residence in Alexandria, Egypt, okay? So the book exists in the two languages of Hebrew and Greek. It's a fascinating book, okay? And in that book known as The Wisdom of Ben Sira, Ben Sira, the author, basically says uh, that he says that, uh, whoop, there goes all my notes here. He says that wisdom is the us of Genesis chapter one, verse 26. He basically just comes out and says it, okay? That's the earliest that somebody comes out and makes that explicit connection between wisdom as, a, as the agent there in uh, Genesis one, verse uh, 26, okay? And then, Another book in the Apocrypha, which dates to the second century BC, okay, known as Baruch, he says that wisdom is to be synonymous with the Torah, okay? And now that's the beginning of the belief that the Torah pre-existed, the Torah given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And of course, it's important for anybody who's a student in the New Testament, okay? Because it's basically revealing that even in Judaism, or at least in Judaism, or in some streams of Judaism, there was this belief that just like Christians believe that Jesus pre-existed his incarnation in New Testament times, the Torah, according to some Jews, pre-existed its existence in Moses's time, okay? That the Torah came from eternity, that it's eternal, okay? That it has no beginning, that it was always there and only was incarnated as the Torah, okay, the five books of Moses, when Moses received the uh, tablets there at the top of Mount Sinai. Where's the beginning of that belief? In this book known as Baruch in the second century uh, BC. Okay, now this is where it really crescendos and becomes the most fascinating with a guy named Philo. Philo is crucial, okay? If you are a serious student of the New Testament and particularly Paul the Apostle, you will be very interested in Philo. Philo was a contemporary of uh, Jesus, okay, or contemporary of Paul, okay? Uh, in other words, a first century person, he lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He never had heard of Paul, never had heard of Jesus, okay? And yet, when you read his corpus of work, so much of what he says finds its echo in Paul's letters, okay? Uh, so he's a very, very important person as it relates to understanding what's called Hellenistic Judaism, the Judaism of the Greek-speaking Jews of the diaspora in places like uh, Greek-speaking Egypt, okay, the Greek-speaking Greek islands, what was called in the New Testament times Asia Minor, what you and I call Turkey today, all that was Greek-speaking, and all the Jews that lived in these uh, places their Bible was the Greek language Septuagint, a book that I mentioned in the last episode. It is the first time that the Hebrew Bible was translated into another language besides Hebrew. It's very important. It dates to, depending on what book you're reading in that Septuagint, it dates any time between the third and second century BC, which means it's as old as the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's one of the most ancient Bibles in existence. It's very important. And all new Bible translations refer to it uh, in order to get a better rendering of maybe a verse of the Old Testament Hebrew, which is eluded scholars, okay? Uh, it's a crucial, crucial testimony. Uh, a biblical uh, a testimony of the Bible from ancient times, okay? So if you want to understand that whole world, Philo is crucial to that. And Philo says in one of his works, he describes the word, okay, or logos. Remember, that's the same word or logos mentioned in John chapter one at the beginning of the gospel, John. Philo, contemporary of these folks who lived in Egypt says that the logos or word of God is actually an archangel or the most ancient ambassador of God. Now he takes it even further by ascribing to the word or logos a mediator role between God and, and mankind, okay? In other words, he says that the logos 
acts as a mediator. I'll, I'll read to you a translation of where he says this. He says, this word or logos is continually a suppliant to the immortal God on behalf of the mortal human race, which is exposed to affliction and misery and is also the ambassador ambassador sent by the ruler of all to the human race or subject race. So here for the first time in Judaism in the first century, contemporary with New Testament times, a Jewish person believes that there's an intermediator or how would you say that mediator? Okay. That mediates between God and humanity. And he calls it the logos, the exact same expression used in the gospel of John. And therefore in this person, Philo, we see what seems to be a dovetailing, okay, at least between some streams of Judaism at the time and uh, the beliefs expressed in the gospel of John. Now, obviously Philo didn't believe in Jesus as that logos or that word. He had never heard of Jesus, okay? It was in some sense, a mediator between God and the human race. And that this went all the way back uh, to before the foundations of the earth itself, okay, to creation. Now, lastly, this is this blew my mind when I read this uh, for the first time a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing to do this teaching. Um, here in another verse, and I'm, by the way, when I finish uploading this, I'll go back and I'll I put in the extended explanation in the video below. I'll cite all the things I'm reading from so that those of you that want to go back and read them on your own, uh, you can do so, okay? Uh, I'll cite everything that I'm reading from, the names of these works, okay? And you can go back and, and do any follow-up study, okay? Here on a in a work of Philo that's called On Flight and Finding, he says that the Logos is the child of God and wisdom, in Greek wisdom being Sophia, a feminine. Not the Trinity, but definitely here referring to something that sounds so much a threesome, okay, God and can, having a child with Sophia, who is wisdom, and that child being known as the Logos, that later church fathers, such as a guy named uh, Origen, Okay, and another church father named Clement referred to Philo the Jew as Philo the Christian, even though Philo was not a Christian by any means. And like I said, never heard of Jesus. So here you have a famous, maybe one of the most important Jewish expositors of scripture in the first century who lived in the Greek speaking world, okay, referring to something that would uh, offend most Jews today, okay, uh, Jew, definitely Orthodox Jews, okay, would dismiss Philo entirely uh, for this uh, statement that I just read, that God fathered something called the Logos through the female Sophia, which is wisdom, okay? Both these lineages, okay, the belief that either the us in Genesis 1, verse 26, is referring to a entourage of angelic beings that God is talking to or conferring with, or the other uh, lineage that he's referring to a secondary agent, whether you want to call that agent wisdom or the logos or the Shekinah, okay? Both these lineages not only are BC before Christ, but they survive long after Christian times. For the church father Tertullian tells us in the second century AD that Jews that he would debate with over that verse, uh, they believed it to be referring to angels, okay? And we read in rabbinic literature all the way into the Middle Ages, Okay, the belief that the Torah pre-existed, the Torah being given the Mount Sinai, and it was through the Torah that God created the world, the world by the Torah and for the Torah. That reminds you of anything in the New Testament. Okay, uh, that belief in the New Testament that the world was created for Jesus and by Jesus. Okay, these are the parallel or competing at times uh, understandings of Genesis 1.26, the pre-Christian belief and the post-Christian Jewish belief alongside the Christian belief. Does any of this make sense? Uh, let me know if you have any questions and uh, I'd be happy to help you with it. Let me know if you think it's even worth keeping this video up. I stumbled through it a little bit. My notes started to fall apart. 
uh, I can always delete this video if I want to. So before I keep it up permanently. So if you're still there, uh, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I don't think you can do that in the comment box, thumb up or thumb down, but let me know if you thought this was worth keeping uh, in the series known as the competing Jewish and Christian interpretations of the Bible. Any comments, folks? Uh, I, all right, great. I do see a couple of thumbs up. Um, I'm going to let it go for just a couple more seconds to see if any of you have any more questions. By the way, you see that I'm filming it somewhere other than my childhood bedroom. A woman took a swipe at me in the last video. She basically insulted me and said, what are you, so strapped for cash that you had to make a video in your childhood bedroom? I thought it was funny, and I wrote her back uh, somewhat jokingly and somewhat serious as an unemployed person. I told her, yeah, I really am that strap for cash. But uh, what she didn't understand is that the reason why I was making the videos in my childhood bedroom is because it's quiet and there's no competing voices. My parents are presently out of the house. I have the house all to myself, which meant I was able to make this video in this room, which is my dad's study. Uh, see the beautiful view through the bay window, painting. Looks a little bit more professional, and hopefully no other people will take a swipe at me. But I can take it. I can take it on the chin if anybody wants to throw a punch uh, and insult the backdrop. This is definitely not a professional studio. I only have a few hundred subscribers to this channel, so it's not even worth investing in that type of thing, a permanent background. But if you help me grow the channel, maybe we'll get there one day, and it will be worthwhile uh, upgrading the background. Which leads me to say, if you want this video to go beyond our little crowd of a few hundred people, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, okay? And um, please consult the uh, extended explanation below the video where I'll provide for you links to follow up reading as well as links to other things if any of you want to uh, links to my own personal information if any of you want to support this work uh, in the weeks and months going forward.